if you want to experience real success, you've got to do the opposite of what the business gurus and experts are telling you to do. In this episode, I'm joined by serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Zero Shoes, Stephen Session. Tune in and learn why business tactics used yesterday won't necessarily work today, why providing value is more important than simply solving problems, and the one business strategy that will always work no matter what. Stephen Fashion is a serial entrepreneur who has never had a job. He's a former professional stand-up comic, an award-winning screenwriter, and a competitive sprinter, one of the fastest men over 55 in the country. Stephen and his wife, Lena Phoenix, co-founded the footwear company Zero Shoes and appeared on Shark Tank, where they turned down a $400,000 offer from Mr. Wonderful himself. Today's episode is sponsored by How to Conquer Your Bullshit with CPR, my free training that will help you bring your message to the masses. Sign up for the free training at rubyframon.com forward slash CPR. And finally, whether you're new to this podcast or a loyal thought leader, please make sure you take a moment to drop a rating and review on iTunes because this shit helps. Now, it's time to do the opposite of what everyone is telling you to do with Steven Session. Hey, thought leaders. I am super stoked about today's guest. Uh, we connected at the New Media Summit last year, and he captured my ears immediately with his funniest fuck personality, but also with the way in which he approaches entrepreneurship and business and how he shows up. So Stephen, welcome to today's thought leader. I'm super excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm uh, disappointed to hear that I did not catch your eyes as well. I'm <laughs> I get that makeover that my wife has been telling me to get and have a little plastic surgery and lose a couple of pounds. Well, you know, what's funny is because um, we did that, the New Media Summit, where our chairs were turned. And, oh, that's and for, right. And for our listeners, um, I was on stage as being featured as an icon and we were all facing the other way. Um, and when someone piqued our interest when they were making a podcast pitch, we would turn our chairs around. Right. So it was it was actually really cool to do things that way because I was then you become super focused on what that person has to say. Well, you know, I'll tell you, you just reminded me of something. I did some work way back when with some people who um, are body centered psychotherapists, and what that means, the idea basically is that as you're talking about whatever's going on, what they're really looking for is some inconsistency between what you're saying and what your body is doing. Mm. So if you're saying that you have nothing to do with that woman and you're nodding your head, yeah, maybe there's something to point out. You know, like I noticed <laughs> when you were saying that you were nodding your head and smiling. Um, so, so I was at, a, uh, at one of the events that they were doing and I went blind. Now that was a hyperbolic way of saying it, but what happened, I'd gotten a corneal abrasion. I'd gotten a scratch on my cornea and um, I was all patched up and so I couldn't see. And it was really interesting. So this whole technique is about watching people to see what their body is doing different what, from what they're saying. Mm. I couldn't see anybody. I found out that I was more effective just listening for some little glitch in their voice mm -hmm. or in their words mm -hmm. than when I was watching. Mm. And so, um, so that was a really fun memory. I mean, it's really interesting. If you, if you really listen to people, uh, there's a lot of information in just subtle little things that we don't normally pay attention to, mostly because we're so overwhelmed with what we're seeing. Yeah, exactly. There's the tonality, there's the way that it's being presented. I mean, one of the things that stood out to me was how comfortable you were on the mic mm. and you were able to be funny yet at the same time speak your message. And the well, we won't be doing any of that today. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the thing that I really loved is that you're, you're committed to doing the opposite of what the quote unquote gurus say you should be doing to yeah. achieve success in your business. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about that because I, I love this idea of doing the opposite of everything well, <laughs> there are two parts to it. So look, when it comes to our business itself, and this is the, the most of a commercial I'm going to give, um, we're doing the opposite of what major footwear companies are doing. So every footwear company for the last 50 years has been doing things where they 
uh, put a whole bunch of padding under your foot. They make these flared soles for motion control. They make things stiff enough to give you support. They put arch support in them. They elevate your feet off the ground. We do the exact opposite of that because everything they're doing, I think the technical term is bullshit, but don't hold me to it. I'm not really good on <laughs> science. Um, uh, but what, that, I mean, what they're doing is they're not letting your feet bend and move and flex and work naturally. And that's what we do. So we're the opposite of pretty much every shoe you'll see on the market. And what that means is we end up with stuff that's not only addictively comfortable, because uh, it's like wide enough for your toes to spread and it lets your feet bend the way they're supposed to and feel the way they're supposed to, but they're good for you. So that's that part. On the business side, ay ay ay. I think, I'm not a fan of uh, violating anyone's First Amendment rights. I think that people should have the right to say what they want to say. And simultaneously, I would like to go into every bookstore and take the entire business success section, all the things that tell you how to become a successful business right. person, and burn them. And, <laughs> um, and by burn them, I just mean make them never exist and have all the people who wrote them you know, hung up to dry somehow. And the reason, it's not really personal, and it's not that I think these people are malicious, although some are. Mm -hmm. Some are undeniably just trying to get you into their workshop. They know that you're not going to actually do anything. They're going to collect your money. They're right. going to tell some story of, you know, how they went from uh, bankrupt to making a billion dollars by telling people how to go from bankrupt to making a billion dollars, mm -hmm. which I find reprehensible. But the bigger thing that they do, and I'm talking about books like Good to Great or, um, God, I don't remember the names of them because I can't think of them, uh, but things that people think of as important books about analyzing what made companies successful. Right. What they're doing is what's referred to as hindsight bias or survivorship bias. It's actually both. They're A, looking at the, the companies that have made it and not the ones who didn't. And then they say, well, there must be something they have in common. Well, that's not true. It's a <laughs> hypothesis. And then they're going to prove their hypothesis correct by identifying the things that these companies seem to have in common. Mm -hmm and ignoring the things that they don't have in common and ignoring all the companies who had those things in common who didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And we don't even have to look at different companies. You can even look at something like Apple. So Simon Sinek has gotten very famous for the, you know, what your why thing is, whatever that is. Yeah. And using Apple as the example, how does he not remember the nineties when we all thought Apple was a shit company? Right. How does he not remember all the failures they had prior to the iPhone, which is the thing that turned them into what they are now? Mm -hmm. um, we forget the Lisa, we forget the, um, the Newton, we forget the myriad products that nearly bankrupted them. Mm -hmm. So we forget when Enron was held up as an example of one of the greatest companies in the world. And so the whole idea, it's a human tendency. We want to figure out what'll make us happy in the future. And so we think that we can identify something in the past that will reliably get us there. We're just wrong and the evidence couldn't be more clear. And people who sell you this story that they know what the secret is, uh, and I'm not even gonna talk about the secret, they mm -hmm. tell you this story and we buy it because we want to find that. We are wired to try and find an answer to that question, what do I need to do to be happy to be successful? And we just ignore that no one has ever come up with an answer that is consistent. Look, if someone said, here's the steps to take, guaranteed they'd stop working after like the third person did it because right. the opportunity would be gone. Yeah. So it's sort of like arbitrage, which is, you know, if, when you know you can buy something for a dollar and sell it for $2, as soon as people know that that opportunity is available, the, the discrepancy in pricing disappears. I mean, that's how markets work. Same mm -hmm. thing with what we're trying to accomplish in business and life. So, um, you know, I like to say that we're doing as well as we're doing. 90% of the reason that we're able to do this is luck. And the other 10% is luck. And then there's a whole <laughs> separate, there's a separate hundred percent that's working our asses off and yeah. being, you know, relatively smart people and, and having other relatively smart people that we met by luck who are working for us. And, right. and then, you know, being lucky about when we did things and how we've done many things. And again, you know, doing good work, but, yeah. uh, but you know, when people paint, now let me back up. You can paint a very, uh, paint by number system for doing certain kinds of things. But like, let's say affiliate marketing, for mm -hmm. example, find a product you want to promote, run advertising to sell someone else's product. You can do things like that. Um, but when you're doing something that's paint by numbers, you're always going to be playing catch up. You're always going to be, things will, the universe will change around you and you're going to have mm -hmm. to change what you're doing to accommodate that. It's not the same as building something 
that has legs, pun intended, since we are a shoe company, mm -hmm. um, that um, where you have control over, well, let's call it a little more control over your destiny than if you're trying to bank on the fact that you found some loophole in the Google search uh, uh, optimization algorithm uh, that's right. going to disappear in six months. I mean, here's the thing too, is the way the world is working now, you know, more and more people are going into entrepreneurship yeah. and more and more people because of that are seeking out these cookie cutter strategies, the X, right. Y, Z, that's going to get me everything that I ultimately want, or the three-step strategy that's going to get me the success or earn me the money or this and that. And you're right. Like our, the circumstances around us are changed. And we ourselves are different. You know, if I were to implement yeah. a strategy that worked for you, that doesn't mean it's going to work for me. If you were going to implement the strategy that worked for you a week ago, it may not work today. Right. Because everything around us is constantly evolving and changing and shifting. Yeah. And this is what people don't take into consideration is that the world around us, and, and it's not just in business, like the world around us, people around us are constantly evolving. Things are well, always shifting. Well, here's, here's a great example of that. So I've been an internet marketer since 1992. I invented a piece of software way back then, blah, blah, blah. Back then, there was no phrase influencer marketing. Right. That wasn't a term. No. Now it's become a thing. And once it became a thing, it became tainted. And people are already not trusting influencers the way they mm -hmm. did because they know there's a monetary exchange. They know that it's probably fake. They know someone's probably doing it just for the cash or, you know, maybe not just for the cash, but they know they're getting paid. So, mm -hmm. you know, as something becomes codified, this is going to, boy, I'm going to prove that I, you know, did well in the SATs. As something becomes <laughs> codified, it becomes ossified. So, you know, it, once you can label it and make it something, it, it's already dying. And here's a funny example from, from, from our business life. Um, when we started Zero Shoes, we, I couldn't do any paid search marketing because um, the, the world we were in, which then was barefoot running, mm -hmm. was taken over by big shoe companies. Or more, more importantly, I say, you know you're in a bad niche when, or niche depending on who you are, when, <laughs> the, when internet marketers selling courses on niche marketing are using yours as an example of where to go after. And the reason is if they're using yours as an example, that means there's a bunch of people spending too much money who aren't paying attention mm -hmm. and then you're extracting some of that money. And so that's the situation we were in early on. But then, you know, those niches change because once people were taking advantage of that, the big companies that were spending $3 a click on the phrase barefoot running suddenly went, wait, what the hell? We're not making money off this. And they stopped and the whole thing disappeared. Now, the good news for people like me is I could then come in and actually find real customers, not just an arbitrage play. Right. So then since things are constantly shifting, yeah. strategies that work yesterday are not going to work today. How do you navigate through this world that we call business? Well, there are some strategies, if you want to call them that, that always work. And that is, a friend of mine said this 25 years ago at one of the first internet marketing conferences. He said, uh, making money is easy. Figure out where the money is flowing and get in the way of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's always the way, whether that's because you're providing a service for companies that are looking for business or you're doing a business, you're always trying to find how do you find the people who want what you want, who are already talking about what you're doing, or how do you interrupt their conversation to inject yours in there in a way that they respond well to, and then offer them something of value. Now, the of value part is where I, again, get all riled up because what most people are doing is telling you the story I know you have a problem and I can solve it when they're mm. lying. Mm -hmm. They know that they're going to have a small enough return rate that they don't care or they're going to move on to the next thing. But right. if you can provide real value to real people, I mean, that's always the way things work or the way you, or that's always what works. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what we're seeing so much of online is like, you have a problem. Yeah. I have the solution. Yeah. Buy it here. And yeah. versus the value piece and the value is the missing piece. This is something that uh, I strive to provide in everything that I offer because I'm a life coach. There's about a million and one other life coaches out there doing the same shit that I'm doing. But at the same yeah. time, the value gets diluted so much because people get caught up in that. I'm going to solve your problem. Here's the right. thing. And then right. see you later. Where right. is the customer retention? Where's the loyalty gone? Where's integrity gone? And where has the value gone? You know, here's a, a, a weird tangent from that. 
um, my wife pointed out the difference between quote alternative medicine and uh-huh. actual medicine is the exact opposite of what people think. Most people, um, they think that quote Western medicine, they say they have all the answers and they're just treating symptoms. Completely not true. If you go to a, mm, let's use chiropractor as an example, my apologies to chiropractors, I could literally <laughs> pick any, uh, let's wait, let's do a better one. Let's do, um, let's do a, um, I'm gonna make one up. Let's do someone who um, uh, clears your colon with chakra infused essential oils. Okay. okay. Thank Fancy. you. Tonight. Yeah, I'm starting that in the <laughs> So you go to that person with any illness, any ailment, any complaint, and I guarantee they'll tell you, oh no, I know the solution. It's the fact that your colon isn't clean and your the colon chakras are going backwards and you don't have the right essential oils in them. Guaranteed this will fix it. You go to an actual doctor, doctor, he's gonna say, Well, here's what I think it is. Let's give it a whirl and see. And then if not, we'll try. So it's totally upside down. The people who are doing the, the, the out there stuff are the ones who actually are claiming they have the answer when they probably don't. And the ones who are really smart are not claiming they have the answer. And they're not trying to just treat the symptom. It's like, it's totally upside down. And I'm mystified that this meme still exists, that it's the other way around. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. And we do see so much of that translate into the business world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so for you, I mean, I'm, I've taken a look at your website and I've taken a look at your videos and the way that you and your wife position yourselves. And stalker. You're very, oh, sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> bit of a stalker. But I mean, it's very much, a, it, you really come from the place of, if I were to buy from a company, how would I want it to feel? Yeah. I immediately felt at home. Thanks. I mean, let's, let's get super real. Like your website doesn't have all the bells and whistles that, you know, maybe like a Nike website would have, but what it has is the connection. Yeah. You've, you've made it to be super personalized. Is this part of the doing what they're telling you not to do or doing the opposite? Yeah. Of what you're doing? Well, you know, it's, it's funny when I first started the company, I deliberately didn't have my face attached to anything because mm. I was thinking, well, if we're going to eventually sell this, I don't want it to be about us. Right. Um, I want it to live independently of us. And so the first couple of videos I made about how to make sandals based on this 10,000 year old design idea, uh, it's like, you know, I said, hi, and then it was my feet for five minutes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And I found that I would go out in public and people would say, hey, I saw your video. I was like, what the heck? Were you looking at my feet? Do you recognize my feet? They go, what? No, I recognize you. So I realized, I mean, I knew this, but I was trying to avoid it. I knew that connecting to people is always better than connecting to just an entity. It's one of the reasons I think that Apple did as well as it did. Now, granted, it was only you know a fraction of what IBM was for a very long time, mm-hmm. but people connected to Steve Jobs early on. They connected yeah. to him. And IBM was always a monolithic thing. Mm-hmm. And so it had a persona. It was cold and gray and yep. impersonal. And, um, you know, but Apple, it's more than that the, they built pers- personality into the product. Steve Jobs was very visible. So one of the reasons that Lena and I became visible for our brand was because we knew people wanted to relate to humans. We also wanted them to relate to us because one of the other things that we saw change in the world is so I started selling stuff again in 1992 online and in the early days people were just like so excited to be able to buy online it was Mm -hmm. really cool and thrilling and wonderful and something changed as bigger and bigger companies got involved where by and large people assume that if you're selling online you're probably trying to screw them Um, and that if there's a problem it's because you were trying to screw them right and and we wanted to make sure people knew there was real humans at the end of this doing the best we could knowing that it's never going to be perfect well you know sometimes is not always going to be perfect Mm -hmm. and that we were here to help as best as we can it here's a great example i love it and by love it i mean hate it when (laughs) when people will post a complaint on some social media account and they don't tag us. They just mention our name, but they don't tag us. Right. And then they complain that we didn't respond to the post that, we, that they did as if we were able to see it. And the beginning of the thing is, if you had just called us, we would have solved that in five seconds. Mm-hmm. So rather than just getting the problem solved by human beings who want to help, mm-hmm. they feel like they need to yell and scream and complain and then yell and scream and complain when they didn't yell and scream and complain correctly mm-hmm. uh, or in a way that would be useful. And I find that just 
frankly mystifying because if I have a problem with a product, my first inclination is to A, call the company, and B, I say something like, you know, this may be me, but here's what I'm experiencing. Is this normal or is there something going on? Because I don't know, and I'm, I guess I just give people the benefit of the doubt, and that's gone away. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the Jerry Springerification of the world mm -hmm. is what's happened on the internet. And yeah. I, I like it, you know, we can't help everyone all the time. Someone will wear a pair of our shoes for six months and then demand a refund for some mm -hmm. reason. It's like, well, we can't do that. No footwear company does that. Neiman uh, Nordstrom does, like, no, no, no. Different thing, different situation. We're not Nordstrom, um, mm -hmm. and they actually don't do what you think. But, uh, but you know, so unfortunately, we just can't do what you want. Well, I'm going to get online and post horrible things about you. It's like, all right, well, send us a link. Yeah. And the the level of discourse has so devolved in a way that I find, again, I, I was going to say mystifying, but that's not true. It's because of anonymity. It's because people feel emboldened because they don't think there's any negative repercussions. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we wanted to be a public face of the company because this is our company. We're a very transparent organization. Our financials are published online. Mm -hmm. we, um, we, we want people to be part of our community. We're building a movement movement and we want people, if they're going to be part of that, we want them to know who they're involved with and they, we want them to want to be involved with us um, and involved in what we're doing. And so, um, uh, so yeah, it's a very different thing than just building a a monolithic enterprise uh, and our and our goal and I, I swear I'll stop ranting on this one for a second our goal is to maintain that personal thing not as a marketing ploy but for real maintain this personal relationship even as we continue to you know almost double every year for the last few years and continue to do that and that's really important to mention how you said and not for a marketing ploy because yeah. a lot of people use that they use these you know I'm gonna be quote unquote authentic <laughs> right? As, yeah, yeah, yeah. as a marketing ploy. I'm going to yeah. be quote unquote, super honest and super transparent <laughs> as a marketing ploy. And then when yeah. the money comes rolling in, they forget that. And that's again, like that piece about integrity and creating loyalty yeah. because loyalty, very your relationship with clients, whether you have a product or a service, that is a relationship. And it, it is, is one that can be nurtured if done correctly. Right. Well, you know, in every, it, there's a whole bunch of emails that I send. Every customer and every prospect actually gets an email that I will confess. Here's a secret. It looks <laughs> like it comes from time, me. everyone. <laughs> it looks like it comes from me personally, but it's part of an automated sequence. Oh, but has, shit. <laughs> but, but. but it has my personal phone number on it. Mm. And, um, and here's another secret. I mean, that email goes out to a couple thousand people a week and maybe once, maybe twice a week, someone actually calls it and they are stunned when I pick up the phone. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I can't, I don't have the time any longer to send a legit personal mm -hmm. email to every human being. Yeah. So, but this is the, you know, it's the email that I was sending. So I right. just made that part automated, but the rest of it, if you can pick up the phone and call me at any time, that's legit. Right. And I mean, that's just part of working efficiently too. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be able to scale while still remaining true to your values. And it feels yeah. to me like you have some really strong values as the backbone of your business and the way that you run your businesses and everything you do really stems from that place. We, when Lane and I started the company, the, I think the entirety of the conversation we had about the philosophy of what we were going to do was we want to build a company that treats people the way we expect to be treated by other companies, but rarely are. And mm -hmm. to make that gap or to bridge that gap is really not hard because what most companies do is just horrible. And, and to be available, to be um, to want to help and to help as, as often as you can, but not every time because you can't just give in when it's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but when we do that, we explain why. When we say things, when someone returns a pair of shoes and we say, you know, look, the, the return policy says new and unworn condition, which is the same policy that Amazon has. It's the same policy that Zappos has, same policy that many multi-billion dollar footwear brands have. When someone returns it and their shoes are full of mud, Mm -hmm. um, and they go, well, I didn't do that. We go, well, we take a picture of every product that's returned the moment we open the box. Are you actually accusing us of taking your shoes out of the box, rolling them around in the mud, and then taking a picture and then accusing you of something? I mean, mm -hmm. really, is that what you're doing? 
And you know, most people then dig in even, even deeper. Well, maybe the post office did that. Really? So now the <laughs> post office. So you know, there's some times where it's kind of like we, we don't have kids, so I'm I'm talking out of my butt when I say this. But right. sometimes it's like being a parent, where you know, you catch your kid with their hand in the cookie jar, and you go, "Are uh -huh. you still in cookies?" And they go, "What cookies? No, I would never, would never do that. Your hand is in the jar." So sometimes <laughs> you have to do that. Um, but, um, but yeah, the fundamental principle is how do we want to, how would we want to treat people if we were on the other end? Who, what would we expect? And can we do that? It's often yeah. So that sounds like such a simple I mean, thing to me. Yeah. And to me, <laughs> I, I agree. Like this feels like a simple thing. It feels like, well, no, duh, this is what we want, how we want to build a business. Yeah. Why do you think it's so difficult for people to wrap their heads around that concept of like, why don't I just build what I would want to invest in or be a part of or buy from? I, I don't know, so I'll make an answer up. Yeah, uh, perfect. I think that one, one reason is that many companies are commodified. So let's think cell phone companies. Mm -hmm. They know their products have problems. Um, first of all, just in customer service in general. Most of the calls you're going to get are people who have a problem, and that's just hard to deal with over mm -hmm. time. You know, it gets a little tiring. But some companies that are commodities, the problem's even bigger. When you're when you aren't offering something that can literally change people's lives, where you get a balance of people going, "Oh my God, thank you, you changed my life," to "Oh my God, I have a problem because the post office screwed up and didn't get something here on time, or you sent the wrong product accidentally, or you know, all the myriad things that can mm -hmm. go wrong." And by the way, I want to highlight like that I said myriad things, not myriad of things. It's one of my <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so <laughs> again, it's SAT time. I didn't know that. Right. Uh, so I think that for a lot of companies, their goal, because they know they're providing a commodity that other people are providing the exact same thing, mm -hmm. they, they've probably done the analysis and found that it's not actually helpful to spend the extra time to really attend to someone. There are right. few companies that say they have. Zappos is one. Nordstrom mm -hmm. arguably is one. Uh, but they're few and far between. The, the culture that you have to create to allow that kind of behavior is, it's not an insignificant thing. And for most companies, um, they're, I, don't, I think they're, they've done the analysis. They're not going to see the shareholder value by doing that. And so they don't. So they treat you like an asshole and, um, and away you go. Mm. And, and, you know, I think with phone companies, they know there's only a couple of places you're going to go to. So if you leave Verizon, you're going to go to T-Mobile. There's going to be someone who goes from T-Mobile to AT&T and someone who goes from AT&T back to you. Mm -hmm. They know it's just a loop. And so why would they bother being better than the other guys when someone's going to leave anyway? Um, yeah. That's my hunch. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's so interesting too, because let's say, so I'm going to give an example of email provider. I use an email provider um, that, convert kit that doesn't do as much as some of the other email providers would do like infusionsoft but one of right. the things that keeps me with convert kit is their customer service is yeah. the fact that like if i actually go into their chat box which they have online someone answers within like probably two minutes if i right. email them they answer within 12 hours and they support me fully in everything that i do and it's yeah it's pretty incredible. And I've never had that level of customer service with, you know, my email provider, but that makes me feel like I want to be a loyal customer. I don't care if they don't have all the bells and whistles that I can get from someone else. I'll figure that shit out by just right. buying some other product, but I love right. them so much that I want to do this. Yeah. It's funny. Um, so we use Clavio and what's really funny about your example is that Clavio doesn't have live chat and I can't mm. pick up the phone and call them. But when I email them, they respond almost immediately. Right. And well, even though I know they're going to do that, I still wish they would have live chat or a phone. Mm -hmm. now, and I'm not going anywhere because I love them. And right. They are hyper responsive. But you also um, reminded me of why Lena and I are diehard Costco members. Mm. We, we went in one day. We had to go to a dinner party. We went in one day to buy a quiche, and we walked out with a couch. And <laughs> confuse those two. That's a great blog post title. <laughs> Walk, yeah. Walked in for a quiche, walked out, walked with, out a with a couch. Um, <laughs> And so we got the couch and it, it was, uh, by the way, way more expensive than the quiche. I mean, that upsell was <laughs> incredible. Um, and oh, wait, here's my favorite part. When we were, it was like one of the roadshow things where they have products that people bring in and they take it around. And the woman who was selling it said, and the material is puncture resistant. And I said, do you mean, do you mean puncture resistant or do you mean 
something else like, uh, you know, a, a abrasion resistant or something other than puncture resistant. Uh -huh. She goes, no, totally puncture resistant. I said, are you sure that's what you mean? As I pulled out my keychain, which is a pocket knife uh -huh. and I opened up the blade. She goes, mm -hmm. yeah, totally puncture resistant. I said, you're serious. This blade will not go into this mattress or this pad or this cushion. She goes, oh yeah. So I stabbed it and uh -huh. went right through. She goes, Huh. Maybe maybe I need to revisit that one. I said, maybe. <laughs> but either way, we bought the couch because I wasn't planning on stabbing a couch or right. you know stabbing someone else on the couch and missing. That was not part of my plan. Right. Uh, the couch though had some problems, and we called Costco, and they said, "We'll see if you can get someone to repair it, and we'll just pay for the repairs." I went, well, that's awesome. So we called a repair guy. He came out and said, "Yeah, this thing is not made well enough for us to bother repairing it. It's just not worth it." And so we called Costco, and we told them that. And they said, well, it just so happens the company that made the couch in the time that we've been talking has gone out of business. And so um, why don't we give you your money back? And we said, well, are you going to come pick up the couch? They went, no, of course not. Keep the couch. It's like, I'm sorry, what? You just gave us a $2,500 couch. And it's not perfect, but I mean, we've now had it for, I think, 10 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we are, you know, we are never leaving Costco. Screw you, Sam's Club. Yeah. Yeah. See, customer <laughs> customer service and um, connection and humanizing your brand and and your company goes such a long way. And so many people see this as like it's just going to take that much more effort. Let me just put in this quick fix strategy to yeah. get X, Y, and Z. When really, in a, in a world where everyone seems to have adopted the AD, you know, ADD mentality where it's like I'm on to the next shiny object, loyalty does go a long way and loyalty yeah. really does matter. And it does. And again, you know, you can't do it perfectly. You no. can't make everybody happy. There are some people who are committed to making your life unpleasant and they're never going to be happy if you gave them everything they asked for. And, yep. and, and that's challenging because we want to help those people too. And at a certain point you realize, oh yeah, I could literally bend over into a pretzel shape and they would still say, you know, I was hoping for a different kind of pretzel. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've met a few of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Stephen, for our listeners, um, if for for them and they in whatever business that they're running, whatever they're building, what advice would you give them to steer away from what everyone else is doing or what all the gurus are telling them to do, um, so that they can come into more of what actually feels right for them and their values and what they want to offer? I think you just answered it. Oh. I mean, really, <laughs> yeah, so thanks. That was easy. Okay. Um, You're done. Yeah, See you it's, later. <laughs> it's, it's starting on the you part and what you want to do and crossing your fingers to a certain extent that that matches with what your audience expects or with what they would like. So it's not trying to, it's not trying to replicate something that's out there. Um, again, you know, that's a viable business model. I, look, look, I know people who, took ideas that I came up with and they did their shitty versions of my thing and they made more money than I did because I set the stage. I mm -hmm. paved the road. Mm -hmm. um, and they're happy that they did it. Totally fine. I, I don't begrudge them anything. I, you know, I understand. Um, when Lotus, which was it, was Lotus or Borland, whichever one came up with the first spreadsheet, the other one copied it. And the second one made more money than the first because the first one had laid the groundwork. Mm -hmm. It's a viable business model. It's just not one that I could do. It's not interesting for me. Um, so if you want to go down that road of being, oh gosh, a little more inventive, a little more creative, a little more authentic, a little more whatever the hell those words are, mm -hmm. throw us out and find your favorite, mm -hmm. um, then it starts with how do you want to do it? What do you, why do you want to do your thing? Um, what are you offering that is unique? And um, and, and again, making sure to the best that you, to the extent that you can, that that matches with what people want. Um, if you, if your authentic thing is being complete douche, um, some people will relate to that. Some people won't. Right. So is that okay with you? I mean, look, if I could, if I could restart my company, it would be really, really tempting to call the company truth footwear and our motto would be bullshit not included. Oh my God, that is so good. <laughs> it's really good, but it would also turn off a whole bunch of people that we would like to help. 
So it would, it would polarize things and attract a certain group of people, and we would have some very entertaining parties, I assure you. But it's not necessarily the best thing for what our mission is about getting people to use their bodies naturally. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so, you know, that, that would have been a fun idea that's not a great fit with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. And so now we're nearing the the end of this episode. And I want to ask you, Stephen, if you have any like final thoughts that you're just itching to share with our listeners. <laughs> um, I have that rash. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, look, the thing that I, I always say to questions like that is uh, whenever possible, get a government job with a pension. <laughs> um, just really, this is not for the faint of heart. And the, you know, when I say that, I know a couple of things. I know that anyone who's a, let's say, true entrepreneur, um, that statement will have no meaning to them whatsoever. They will right. continue with their idea no matter how stupid it is. Mm -hmm. And anyone who get, for whom it gives a little pause, get a government job with a pension. And, and I wish I could say that I was really joking, but I'm 56 now and I've got friends who are retiring with their government jobs and pensions. Mm -hmm. And man, that looks good. And it would have been tricky to convince me when I was 20 something that there was a government job with a pension that would have been interesting enough for me to pursue for my life. Mm -hmm. But I bet there are. In fact, I know there are. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, when I was in college, my cognitive psychology mentor was very upset that I didn't go into academia because we were doing some really fun research together. And it just didn't strike me as the thing that was the right place for me. I may have been wrong. I mean, there's a lot of really cool people who I've met who, when I hear about their lives, it sounds pretty good. And, you know, maybe I would have been able to, you could have talked me into that. You couldn't talk me into a job at Procter & Gamble marketing toilet paper, mm -hmm. but maybe you could have talked me into, you know, working at Harvard and doing research on things that I found interesting. Mm -hmm. So, or even something less than Harvard, as if there's anything less than Harvard, <laughs> um, uh, whatever that means. So, uh, so I guess what that means is that paradoxically, given the nature of this conversation, mm -hmm. entrepreneurialism is not necessarily the best path. It's kind of like in um, the guy Kawasaki, Kawasaki, Kawasaki guy. No, Kawasaki. no, 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 no. Uh, that's not what I was thinking of. Um, oh. <laughs> Robert, Robert Kiyosaki. I was getting them confused. Okay. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, nothing like Guy Kawasaki. So in the Rich Dad, Poor Dad books, where it's all about how to be an entrepreneur and be, you know, start your own business, he never really mentions the fact that the only way you can do that is if you find a whole lot of people who aren't going to do that. They're mm -hmm. called employees. You need people who are going to work with you and for you and do the things that need to get done. And sometimes that's a really good gig. Mm -hmm. and can be really, really satisfying. And we, we, I think in the West in particular, we um, exaggerate the value and we kind of put on a pedestal this idea of being the lone wolf who goes out and does this thing on their own and creates or whatever. But boy, there are a lot of really good jobs that need to be done well. Mm -hmm. And if you instead are working with someone who appreciates that, that can be even more satisfying because you know what happens at five o'clock? You go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, entrepreneurship isn't for the faint of heart. And I think that it takes a lot of effort, dedication and resilience to do what we do. Um, and it's, that's... It's, a, it's a brain injury. <laughs> it is undeniably some sort of cognitive malfunction. We're just, we're just insane. That's what it is. <laughs> we, don't, we don't perceive risk the same way other people do. Mm -hmm. What I, what we're doing does not seem risky to yeah. Lena or I. It is. We have a $2.3 million loan from JP Morgan Chase that we have personally guaranteed. That is crazy. Mm. And the fact that we can do that and sleep at night is, you know, that's not what normal people do. Right. Yeah. So in short, entrepreneurship <laughs> is for the insane. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Great. That, end, let's, of story. end of story. And we're let's, done. <laughs> we're done. Let's cap it off right there, Stephen. Stephen, you have been a delight. It has been an awesome. I don't think I've ever laughed that much on an episode before. So uh, thank you so much for being pleasure. here. Um, why don't you tell our listeners how they can stalk you online? And oh, I will online. include those. Yeah, and I will include those links um, in the show notes. Awesome. So uh, we are at zeroshoes.com. That's X E R O shoes, plural.com. And then either at zeroshoes or slash zeroshoes on pretty much every social media platform you can find.
Awesome. Cool. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us on today's Thought Leader, where I'm challenging you to rise up, speak up, and create a movement. Be sure to drop a rating and review on iTunes. And if you have any questions for myself or Stephen, please reach out to us on social media. My handle is at I am Ruby. I will see you all here next week for a brand new episode of today's Thought Leader.